In recent years, the zebrafish, Danny O'Ririo, has joined Xenopus as a widely studied model of vertebrate development. It's a great animal model for many of the kinds of developmental biology questions that have been answered in recent years. It is a great animal model for a variety of reasons. The zebrafish have large spawnings, they breed all year, are easily maintained, and have transparent embryos that develop outside the mother. Now, being a transparent embryo is a great advantage for our embryologists and developmental biologists because using the new microscopy methods, it's possible to see the internal organs very readily and to be able to follow their development. And if you label those embryonic structures to be able to follow where development takes the various precursors to those structures. In addition, a number of mutants can be created in this particular species, uh, Danny O'Ririo, by using methods that are very similar to what's been used in Drosophila, and that is to use mutagens to affect, in particular, the males, and I'll mention a little bit more about that later. In addition, the fish develop very rapidly, and by 24 hours after fertilization, the embryo displays a characteristic tadpole-like form. And you can see, and we'll, we'll go through this in a little more detail later, but basically uh, fertilization has taken place here now. So this is indeed a zygote. Uh, there's a one-cell stage blastodisc that's formed. This is the yolk cell here. So this is all yolk material, and this is really the animal pole at this point, the animal hemisphere. As development progresses, divisions are made initially meridional divisions, ending up in this case with a, an eight cell stage, and it goes on to further divisions. The yolk maintains the single cellular structure, although it forms a syncytium because a number of nuclei come down from the animal pole region and start to divide in this yolk cell cytoplasm. Development progresses, again the blastodisc develops in most of the uh, Divisions are taking place up here as far as future formation of the organs that are going to give rise to the adult structures in the animal. Here's the animal pole now, just going through very quickly. We'll go through this again. Uh, the epiblast and hypoblast. There is the embryonic shield that forms. This is a very significant structure in that it is comparable to the dorsal lip of the blastopore in the amphibian. In other words, this is the embryonic organizer. And here you can see the embryo is forming along this yolk cell. It's a single yolk cell that has a number of nuclei in it, so it is a syncytial cell. Neural structures are beginning to form by the stage here. You can see that a number of neurologically related structures, which include the eye and the ear, and a neural tube is forming. Here are some myotomes. These are the muscle cells, again, around that yolk cell, the tail bud area is beginning to form, and it's taken on a tadpole-like structure, not free swimming yet because of the uh, lack of uh, streamlined characteristics that are needed to swim, but in fact, this has all happened in a 24-hour period. So development takes place very rapidly. Another very significant advantage of this organism is that you can inject these various cells that are formed in the blastodisc layer, and you can follow their development. And you can readily follow their development because you can see them readily in light microscope. So if you were to put a fluorescent dye in this cell, you would be able to follow where that cell went all the way up into an adult animal. And particularly if it is incorporated into the genome, such as a green fluorescent protein might be, so that it is expressed and all of the subsequent cells that stem from that original cell that you injected would express that same fluorochrome, such as green fluorescent protein, as I mentioned, or red fluorescent protein. If we look at the process of mutagenesis, now in Drosophila, mutagenesis was done in a very, very similar manner. And what happens is one of the males one, a male, while it's in the embryonic state, is mutagenized with some kind of mutagen. And when they're mated with a wild-type female, if that animal expressed a dominant mutation, you would see it in the F1 generation. And ordinarily, it's less likely to see a dominant mutation when you mutagenize in this way. However, in the F1 generation, then, you will get offspring that can 
carry the mutation again, and when two of the offspring carry that recessive mutation, then 25% of a given spawning would show that mutation. These are the various combinations possible when you have a mating of the F1 generation, but if you get the plus M times plus M wild type mutant, wild type mutant, 25% of those recessive genes will get together and you will basically have a, a mutation that you can study. And, and many, many very valuable mutations have been created in this way in zebrafish. Furthermore, since zebrafish development occurs in the open and the embryos are transparent, you can follow these mutations and detect mutations very readily, unlike you would be able to in something like a mammal or a chick, where you obviously can't see these very readily. In the case of the zebrafish, you can look through a microscope, pick out a mutation readily in the heart or the liver or some internal organ, and be able to pick those out at a very early stage to do various kinds of analyses on these. Another major advantage that uh, has come into uh, use in developmental biology, and we've already talked about this, fluorescent proteins that can be fused to a regulatory region of a, a gene, such as in this case where this green fluorescent protein, there are also red fluorescent proteins, so you could use two different colors in the same embryo if you wanted to, fused to a regulatory region of, a, in this case, uh, as I mentioned, a zebra fish sonic hedgehog gene. And the hedgehog gene is a gene that will promote the development of certain kinds of embryonic cells into nerve cells. These are retinal cells that have labeled now with green fluorescent protein. These are the nares, the nasal cells that are sensory. And if you look at higher magnification, you can see that certain individual cells are labeled. So they are expressing sonic hedgehog. Some of the cells are not labeled. So they are not expressing the sonic hedgehog. So you can pick out individual cells. The other thing you can do with these fluorescent proteins now, and with some of the new microscopy methods where you have real-time fluorescent microscopy, you can uh, look at living specimens and you can watch the development of these from the time perhaps you injected this into precursors for retinal cells at earlier stages and then be able to follow those as development progresses. You can watch the cell divisions in a living embryo, record them, and uh, really do uh, some pretty sophisticated mapping studies of where these cells go. You can also treat embryos that have been labeled in this way with various mutagens and see how this might affect the cells as well. Let's now look at the cleavage in zebrafish. Although the cleavage is very, very different from what you see in Xenopus, once cleavage takes place, the actual embryology of that developing embryo is, is pretty similar. It's very similar to Xenopus. This is a beautiful representation using scanning electron microscopy. And here you can see that uh, this is one cell stage. Here's the animal cell up here. Here's the yolk cell. So this represents the vegetal part of the embryo at this early stage, and this is the animal part of the embryo. Meridional cleavages take place initially, and so you end up first with a two-cell stage. Here's the yolk cell, and then you have a 90-degree division of that initial cell. You have another 90-degree division, and those two cells end up forming four cells, another meridional division, and you end up with eight cells. And at this point, then, you have an equatorial division, and you end up with uh, 16 cells and, and 32 cells. Now, interestingly, these cells maintain connections from this time all the way over to here and beyond. You have connections between the individual cells in the animal region and these cells with the yolk cell. So there are actually cytoplasmic connections that keep these cells in contact. And these cells will migrate quite a ways away and maintain those cytoplasmic connections. And that's something that's being studied. It was found initially by injecting materials into the yolk cell and finding that some of these materials 
fluorescing materials would end up way out here in these cells because they were passing through these channels that you could also then visualize. Since only the blastodisc, which is this animal region, forms the embryo, this kind of cleavage is referred to as discoidal cleavage. The other thing that's significant is since this cleavage does not go all the way through, we learned earlier that this is referred to as meroblastic cleavage. In other words, because of the large amount of yolk, it's only partial cleavage. So meroblastic comes from the Greek word meros or part. So it's a part of a cleavage. The cell divisions start, as I mentioned, as meridional, then go to equatorial. They're very rapid. The divisions are very rapid. So every 15 minutes, these cells divide. By the time the cells divide 10 times or so, they get to a point where they're on top of the blastoderm and you have uh, somewhere around uh, more than a thousand cells. Uh, I think it's a thousand four cells. Once the cells reach the about the mid blastula stage, a transition takes place. And this transition is when the cells reach a point where the zygotic genes take over. Up to about halfway through the blastula stages, and that's true in amphibians as well, and it's true in mammals and birds also. Initially, everything is controlled by the RNA and the proteins and the other things that are put in the ovum by the female, by the mother. However, at about the mid-blastula stage, and it's somewhat different in different organisms, you start to get production of materials under zygotic gene control, so under the zygotic nucleus. So it's coming from both the male and female at that point. It's at that point that those cells will start to migrate. And the reason they can migrate now is they're under their own control. And so it has been extrapolated that the reason the cells maintain those cytoplasmic contacts with the ovum initially with that yolk is that they are still receiving signals and information from the mother's RNA that was put in that original ovum. Now when it comes under zygotic nuclear control these cells can migrate away, break those cytoplasmic connections, and they can start to function on their own. And at that point as well the cells start to slow down in their division. They have to do their own things now so they're not quite as efficient as in the early stages when they were working uh, under the control of those materials that were already present in the cytoplasm. At this time there are actually three distinct cell populations that become evident and we can look here at this illustration. The first thing is the yolk syncytial layer. This yolk syncytial layer with the syncytial nuclei are down here. There's an enveloping envelope on the outside. There's some deep cells. This is all part of the animal hemisphere now. This is the yolk cell. And you get the syncytial nuclei that have come from divisions of these cells up in the animal region. Particularly, it's thought, from the enveloping layer. They come down. Uh, you also have a number of microtubules in the yolk cells to give the yolk cells some rigidity. You can see some of the nuclei that have extended down to form this syncytial layer. This is a yolk material. This part is called the blastoderm, as you can see, and there is an internal syncytial layer as well as an external yolk syncytial layer. If we look at this fate map, here's the animal pole, of course. Uh, these are some of the structures that will come out of the ectodermal areas, very much the same in all of the vertebrates. We have uh, epidermis, we have the neur neural and uh, sensory organs, the brain, spinal cord, nasal area, eye area. In the mesodermal area, again, same structures that you would have in amphibians or birds or mammals. Somatic muscle, the somites, the muscle, the skeletal muscle. The kidney areas, some of the mesodermal areas that give rise to the blood, the limbs in the form of fins in the case of fish, heart muscle notochordal material, uh, that's the dorsal mesoderm, the notochord. And in the endodermal area you get derivatives of the gut, including the intestine, liver, and also the respiratory system. And then down in this yolk cell you continue to have 
nutrient material to keep these uh, various other kinds of pre-organ tissues forming in the direction that they need to form. Let's now talk about gastrulation. At first glance of these zebrafish diagrams look perhaps significantly different from the Xenopus and certainly different from the bird and mammal, and we haven't gotten to that yet, but basically the processes are very, very similar. With regard to gastrulation and the formation of germ layers, all three layers of the zebrafish blastoderm undergo epiboly. The first cell movement of fish gastrulation is the epiboly of the blastoderm cells over the yolk. And here you see the internal yolk syncytial layer. These cells are moving down over that yolk. This is the animal pole area up here, animal hemisphere. There's the enveloping layer. There, this is the external yolk syncytial layer, internal yolk syncytial layer, as I mentioned. There's a deep layer that will become the embryo. Uh, this is going to be the ventral part of the embryo, the belly part of the embryo. This is going to be the back of the embryo. Here's the yolk cell. Animal hemisphere up here, animal pole. Vegetal hemisphere down here, vegetal pole. As development progresses then, you start to get this, uh, well, you get this epiboly moving down, and then you get what's called an involution, just like in what's taking place and what took place in the amphibian. There's a hypoblast region that will give rise to the mesendoderm. There's a germ ring. And if we look at higher magnification, you could see that these cells are ingressing. Just like in the amphibian, the outside layer coming in, forming a middle layer between the endoderm and the epidermal type layer uh, that's like mesoderm. So these are involuting cells. Some of the cells are non-involuting. Here's the yolk syncytial layer down here. And as development progresses then, and this, this is taking place very rapidly, four hours, six hours, and now we're at nine hours for post-fertilization. The hypoblast mesendoderm is moving in. This is going to give rise to mesodermal tissue, just like in the amphibian layer. And this is comparable to the dorsal lip of the blastopore. And it's going to be called the embryonic shield. This is comparable to the dorsal lip of the blastopore. And we're going to call this the embryonic shield but is basically like the dorsal lip of the blastopore. So this will involute to form three layers, endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. The ectoderm will give rise to the epidermis and various neurological tissues. We already mentioned the mesoderm would give rise to various mid-layer tissues in the animal's body, including muscle and skeletal material, number of organs, heart, blood vessels, and, and blood cells, and the endodermal tissues will give rise to the gut and other endodermal derivatives. And by 10 hours then, you are starting to get the layers that are definitive. This, keep in mind, is the dorsal part of the embryo. So this is going to be the neural layer that will form up here. Here's the trunk region. You'll get a, the tail area here, the posterior part of the embryo. Here's the anterior. This will form the head area. And this is going to be the belly area of the embryo. This will be the endoderm. And that's the yolk material that's ending up uh, with this syncytial layer forming into an endodermal type of material. I'd like to now talk about the embryonic shield. And what you can see here is that the embryonic shield, being comparable to the dorsal lip of the blastopore, allows most of the same things to happen here. In particular, it allows the formation of three germ layers. Uh, epiboly continues with the outer layer here extending down over the uh, yolk material. But these cells are involuting by the pro same process of involution that happens in the frog embryo to form those three layers of, well, end up having three layers. The endoderm is already in there. But uh, mesoderm and, and ectoderm. So you have end up with three layers, endoderm, mesoderm, ectoderm, the ectoderm, of course, gives rise to the skin and epidermis and neurological tissues, including sense organs, pigment cells, and so forth, neural crest cells. The mesodermal area will uh, form into mesodermal derivatives, muscle, blood, skeletal materials, 
uh, and a variety of internal organs, and the endoderm forms into the gut as well as to uh, structures that are uh, going into the respiratory system, including in the fish, an air bladder, which is, uh, has some similarities developmentally to uh, lung tissue. If we look at uh, the B area here, here uh, again is that embryonic shield. We're getting movement of these cells. Involution is taking place and it's heading up in this direction. It will form cordomesoderm. It's forming mesoderm, but cordomesoderm, so it's going to form the notochord. And you can see diagrammatically the way that extends into the top part of the embryo that will go all, all the way up to the animal pole and to the anterior part, really, of the embryo. This is, uh, in C here, this is a, a marker for the cordomesoderm, and it starts here. The cordomesoderm material starts here, and it starts to extend up the middle. And this uh, particular uh, growth factor, uh, it is called the T-box transcription factor, but it's, it's really a marker for cordomesoderm. And you can see that the cordomesoderm, the notochord material, is extending up the full length of the embryo. I would now like to talk a little bit more about the embryonic shield as an organizer in the fish embryo and look at some of the similarities it has in experiments to the dorsal lip of the blastopore in amphibians. As mentioned before, the embryonic shield is really homologous to the dorsal lip of the blastopore in amphibians, and it's critical then for establishing dorsal ventral axes. Shield tissue can convert lateral and ventral mesoderm into dorsal mesoderm. Some work by an individual by the name of Oppenheimer in 1936, followed by Kushida in 1998, did some very elegant studies in which they took the dorsal area here of the embryonic shield, transplanted into a host embryo on the opposite side from where the normal embryonic shield was, and just as in the Spayman and Mangold experiments, two embryos formed. So you've got a secondary embryo form. Uh, as far as the material that was transplanted, about 100 cells were taken from this area in the transplant, and that 100 cells was able to convert this animal material, this part of the animal hemisphere, into a whole new embryo uh, in a different host. With regard to axis formation of the zebra fish embryo, uh, just to go a little further, axis formation, if we look at this, this is uh, now prior to gastrulation. The zebrafish blastoderm is arranged with a presumptive ectoderm near the animal pole, the mesoderm in this middle area, and the endoderm below that, but all of this above the yolk cell prior to gastrulation. There are some general mesodermal inducing signals that take place here, and there is a major dorsal mesoderm inducing signal on this area toward the dorsal aspect of the embryo. This is a dorsal aspect. This is going to be the ventral aspect of the embryo anterior, posterior, down here. And as this development progresses then, the yolk syncytial layer sends two signals, two presumptive mesoderm. One signal induces the mesoderm to form. A second signal specifically induces the area of mesoderm to become the dorsal mesoderm. And here again, the formation of the dorsal ventral axis during gastrulation. The ventral mesoderm secretes a uh, material called BMP2B to induce the ventral and lateral mesodermal and epidermal differentiation. And the dorsal mesoderm secretes various factors, cordon being one of them, to give rise to the embryonic shield. Keeping in mind that we have called the embryonic shield the primary inducer, but now something is inducing the primary inducer. And that something has been named the Nucoop Center. In this case, it's the Fish Nucoop Center. Nucoop was a scientist from the Netherlands who did early work, uh, but completed that work probably and published it in 1972. 
But basically what Newcoop and his colleagues found was that there were materials that caused the formation of the embryonic shield and that caused the formation of the dorsal lip of the blastopore in amphibians. What he did, just very briefly, I won't go through the experiments in detail, but he took embryos that were they were amphibian embryos. He took the embryos and he removed the dorsal lip of the blastopore. And he would let those embryos develop. Of course, they didn't form em embryos because they didn't have a dorsal lip. They didn't have a primary uh, organizer. However, he then took some cells from the endodermal area, from the lower part of the endodermal area, which were not cells that gave rise to the dorsal lip of the blastopore, but he then transplanted those cells into embryos in which the dorsal lip of the blastopore had been removed. And what they did was to induce the formation of a new dorsal lip of the blastopore. So basically, this was the organizer of the primary organizer. So uh, that was work that uh, has gone on now in the zebrafish. He did it initially in uh, Xenopus. And further work is being looked at in terms of how this operates and how it causes cells to begin to become organizer cells and organizer tissues. Just very quickly, I'd like to mention a little more about organizer function. I won't go into the details of this, but beta-catenin is an important organizer, which will give rise to some other materials, cordon being one, noggin, goosegoid, and uh, some other things, squint, stat3, and so forth. These are factors which will result in the organization of the zebrafish to have anterior, posterior organization. You don't need to remember all the details of this, but just realize that there are organizer genes in the zebrafish that beta-catenin activates in order to cause this axis formation to take place. The final thing I wanted to talk about, just again briefly, is the left-right axis formation. We think of vertebrates as being bilaterally symmetrical, and, and we're classified as bilaterally symmetrical, but as a matter of fact, we're really not totally symmetrical. In all vertebrate study, the right and left sides do differ anatomically and developmentally. In fish, for example, the heart is on the left side. In humans, it's on the left side. And in uh, birds, it's on the right side, the aortic arch. So there, there's a difference in the uh, way that left and right halves are oriented. And one of the early studies that had been done was with uh, a modal cilia syndrome in a mouse model. And, and I'm just relating that to you to give you a little perspective here. Cilia are necessary for orientation. Cilia will set up waves of tissue movement by, moving, by having waves of fluids on the surfaces of cells and on the surfaces of structures. And so the cilia will direct, in a sense, whether the aortic arch becomes dominant on the right side or the left side, or whether certain structures in the brain are more dominant on the right side or on the left side. And here, here you can see in this case there is a, uh, a left-right symmetry, and this, this is a zebrafish uh, embryo, and here's a brain. As in other vertebrates, the nodal-related genes are expressed on the left side. The nodal cilia in the Kupfer vesicle is what causes this left-right asymmetry in the zebrafish embryo. And there are various factors that are involved in that, signaling factors, growth factors, uh, bone morphogenic protein, etc., that are involved in this kind of left-right orientation and the left-right axis formation. The analysis of embryological development in the amphibian Xenopus lavis and the fish Danio ririo have developed the field of developmental biology very significantly, particularly in the past 10 to 20 years. The proposed chemical agents that we 
would read about in the early studies and, and soluble factors referred to in the 1920s and 30s, thanks to these species, have now received names, uh, as well as some of the intercellular pathways of paracrine and transcription factors also have gotten names, and we understand how they work. Things like cordon, noggin, fibroblast, growth factor, FGF, BMP, went sonic hedgehog, etc. Things that scientists back in the 30s and 40s had no idea existed uh, are now understood very thoroughly, and the pathways are understood as well, and how these cells function and how these materials function on cells is understood pretty well. So the international research program that was really initiated by the pioneering research of Hans Spayman and Hilda Mangold and others has now reached a level of complexity and understanding far beyond what was envisioned, I believe, by those scientists of that era, far beyond what they could have ever imagined possible. Nevertheless, just as the Spayman era experiments brought up many new questions, so our new answers to these classical experiments, to these classical questions, have now generated an additional set of new and exciting questions waiting to be answered by the current generation of developmental biologists who will be concentrating for a while at least, on elucidating the advanced molecular genetic mechanisms of developmental biology and of life itself.